Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon is Central Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention. The next event is scheduled for June 24th through 26, 2002 in Norman, Oklahoma. However, they need your help to put on the next event. Please visit SoonerCon.com to find out how you can help make SoonerCon 30 a reality. The Hellmouth Convention The Hellmouth Convention is a celebration of all pop culture, but specifically things like Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. It is held in Los Angeles, California, and the next event is scheduled for June 3rd through 5th, 2022. Proceeds benefit the Los Angeles LGBT Center as well as the Ron Glass Memorial Scholarship Fund. For more information, go to thehellmouth.org. On tap today, we have David Giancola. How are you doing today, sir? Pretty good, my friend. It's it's actually like in 70s, well, mid-80s here in Vermont, which is great because it can be in the, you know, minus 20s, and that's always not so much fun. So it's a great day here in Vermont. Uh, so I've heard Vermont is one of the few states in the Union I have not been to. It's, you know, it's really funny when I travel, Aaron, I, and very like people don't know the United States the way you think that they should, like they should have all learned it in school. Mm-hmm. And very often I say, oh, I'm from Vermont. And they say, oh, what province is that from? Assuming that Vermont is part of Canada. <laughs> and I'm not, not that hasn't happened to me one time. That's happened to me a dozen times, which is like, okay, whatever. That's fine. We are close to Canada, so. Believe it or not, you have some sympathy with people from New Mexico because there's a huge part of the population that thinks they're part of actual Mexico. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I, I've been up to the Massachusetts area quite a bit. I've been to Maine, but the chunk in between, I haven't quite hit yet. Well, when you get time, you got to come up here. It is a beautiful place to live. Um, it can get really slow up here, which is why people come up here for vacation. Same place, like, same thing with Maine and places like that, so, which is why I spend a bit of time in New York City and LA and things like that. But um, it's a it's a great place to live, um, and I don't. I was just up uh, further north of where I live, and um, I don't know if you do you know the character actor M Emmett Walsh? Yes. Yeah, just got to meet him. He's from Swanton, Vermont, native, and um, had the most fantastic discussion with him two days ago. Um, I was up there buying a boat and. Uh, he, you know, and I, and he did, I don't know if you remember the, the Coen Brothers Blood Simple. He played the, the I think he was the, um, he was the, the killer in that or something. What a great guy. What a great actor. A lot of fun. There's a lot, there's a lot of talent up here hidden in the woods and they come up here to hide and then they go back and do work. So. And you have made a career out of doing indie film in an area where that's not usually that you thought to be the bread and butter. No. And matter of fact, there's no tax incentives up here in Vermont and, and, the film industry as we knew it up in here in Vermont doesn't exist. There's, you know, there's a couple of friends, and like I said, and there's actors and people who would hit out up here, but the industry that, uh, that I rocked in the nineties with some partners in the 80, or late eighties uh, doesn't exist up here anymore. Um, it's, you know, everyone's going to tax incentive states. Even Hallmark makes these movies that are set in Vermont and they're not shot here. So. And, and that's a shame because one of the things I like to champion on, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, my window is quiet. Uh, one of the things I like to champion on this show is that you don't have to live in one of those places if you, it's not convenient for you. But if you're creative, if you have the drive, you can still make it happen. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think that you can be creative anywhere. And um, uh, th- there are actors who live up here, who come up here to write screenplays and plays Broadway plays, I mean, and things like that, that I know of that I'm like, uh, they're like, don't tell anyone that I've got this cabin up here or this house up here because it's my escape. I think, but, Mm -hmm. you know, for me and I live here, I think wherever you live, you can live in Ohio and make something great. You know, I I don't think you need to be in New York or LA. I've always been a big champion of that, same as you, that, you know, being in a big metropolitan area, it may be good for networking, but it's not necessarily some type of answer for creativity. It isn't. And you have, like you just said, you're out of the way. You don't have to compete for the same resources. You may not have the initial tax incentives. The networking, like you said, may be a challenge. But like I live in central Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Wasn't born and raised here. Came here midlife, mid my life, I mean, but that's another story. And 
there's a thriving film community here where you wouldn't expect there to be one. Sure. But people just say, hey, you're a director, you're a writer, you're a musician, let's make something happen. Right, right. And, and it, what's interesting, I find, about there not being much of a film community up here. There was a film community up here in the early 90s and in, in late 80s. And uh, the fact that there's not, I think, speaks more to the internet um, and not and and people kind of giving up on networking and staying in touch, rather than tax incentives. Because most of the movies that most of the interesting movies that were being made up here were made, being made so cheaply, there was who no one gave a crap about tax incentives. You know, just make what you want to make, and that's true with my last film, Accelerator, which I made. We shot in 2016, 2017, didn't come out till about 2020. Um, but we had no tax incentives, and we still made it on the cheap. And we didn't need tax incentives because everything was cheaper here because there wasn't a lot of film production. So when you bring, when you go to somebody and say, I need this and we're making a movie, by the way, you get a better deal. You know, you get it, you can negotiate a rate and, you, and, and, you know, it works for us. So, uh, you know, not that I'm not going to end up in Northern Canada making a movie next, but that's what's working for us, you know? So. And it's what works that makes it happen. I, for example, Let's just address the fact, right? I am a huge MST3K fan. I got to know you through Time Chasers. Right. That's the elephant in the room, but I love the it's movie. It's not for me. It isn't for me. I mean, it, okay. you're, you're, it's not a newsflash that um, part of the reason you and I are talking is because of Mystery Science Theater 3000. I will be very clear and get this out of the way now that uh, I know that the longevity of, uh, well, it's interesting. There's a lot to talk about, but the longevity of my career started because Mystery Science Theater liked Time Chasers and we got mm -hmm. on the Sci-Fi channel and that kind of gave us a boost to do more other films. And so it's kind of funny. I have these Mystery Science Theater fans and then I have people that I know where I make other movies that have nothing to do with Mystery Science Theater or any, or any of the fan base riff tracks or whatever. Um, but I will be honest that the Mystery Science Theater and riff tracks fans are a whole lot more fun. So thank you. It's all good. The, the thing that, I mean, I don't want to go too far into the puppet realm here because I know you, we want to talk about your movies per se, but the thing that always struck me as interesting is that in the specific case of Time Chasers, the time between when the movie was made and when they decided to do it was incredibly short by their standards. Yes. And I'm very curious to see how that came to be. What, what was in the secret sauce of Time Chasers that made that happen? Well, um, I mean, I can't answer all, you know, all the gaps about that, but I can tell you that um, what I was told, and this was back in, uh, the movie was made in 90, 91, released in 93. Um, what I was told was, the Rift Track, the, the Mr. Science Theater guys told me this. Um, they had a show on the Sci-Fi Channel, they had movies to riff, and they didn't have a large budget. Um, and they wanted to get away from just doing movies from the fifties and things like that. And at one point back in the day, you would send out VHS screeners, physical screeners of every movie. And they were given a box of screeners and they went through the box of screeners and discovered time chasers and, and licensed it based on finding it in a box of VHS screeners. Uh, that's what they told me. I don't know if that's completely true. Um, but time chasers came out at a time when VHS was dominant, there was no DVD. Um, our initial release, we made more on foreign sales than we made on domestic, which was really common for the kind of filmmaking we were doing at the time. You know, we were making movies that, there was a time where you could release just about anything foreign if it was shot in the United States and you could make money. And we did that for a very long time. Time Chasers, um, for whatever reason, was just a little too cerebral, a little not action enough, if you can believe it. Um, a little too not on the nose for the foreign market. So we didn't quite get it there. And they were, that was back when you'd want to sell domestic anywhere you could. And so we, you know, our sales agent, and I've told this story in various virgin, versions over and over, uh, our sales agent, you know, submitted it to Sci-Fi Channel and MST3K and he called us and said, um, and by the way, the only way we could see here in Vermont and our crew, and we had a staff at that point, about 12 people making movies and TV commercials and whatever. 
we would have to share VHS tapes, which is, was the original way people got to know MST3K was they, they tape it off air and then share the tapes because you, you, you couldn't get the sci-fi channel everywhere. So my distributor called me one day and said, I've got good news and bad news. I said, oh, okay, hit me with it. And I said, what's the good news? He says, well, sci-fi channel watch a movie. I said, that's fantastic. He said, what's the bad news? Well, they want to put it on this show called MST3K. I'm not really sure what it is, but they make fun of movies. And I said, dude, that's not really bad news. That's a really great show. We love it. Why not? Um, and that's how it all went down. As to, as to why, I think it's because at that point, there was a lot of independent movies. Um, there, there, were, there were more barriers to entry because you had to shoot on film. But, um, you know, finding something that we did that, I was so young when I made it and it was so innocent and in the pile of VHS tapes, which I'm sure included a lot of really bad stuff. I think, I think we kind of stood out. Um, it, it, not so much in being bad, but in being honest in what we wanted to do filmmaking wise and what we want to achieve for the audience. And that's how we, that's why we're talking now, you know, um, and that's all good. It's all good. The period of time you're talking about is what I'd like to call the period before the golden age of independent film. Mm -hmm. It's in that period right before when the technology price has gone down, which right. is like late 99, early 2000, and way before the kind of the point where Netflix starts pumping crazy amounts of money into it and just skewing all the economics of it. You're in that period where you need money and you need talent and you you really have to have a project that is so worthwhile because nobody's going to waste their time on it otherwise. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, the, what, what the problem now is the barrier to entry to making a feature film is really low. Mm -hmm. You, you can make a, you can, my, here's my iPhone, you know, you can make a movie with this mm -hmm. that looks pretty damn good um, and release it. And uh, how many people will see it? Well, that's up to the marketplace, but the marketplace is so flooded with people who are shooting movies on this, or, or on their, uh, you know, a camera that their, their parents bought them and, you know, didn't bother to learn, didn't bother to think about the script or the story or the acting or the set design or anything else, but hey, I got the equipment, so let's make it. That's really the problem right now. There's too much crap in the marketplace. And we used to say that in the 90s, but it's times a thousand now. So. And, you know, and there's also the case that if you have any credit to your name if you can get somebody to look at you and you say i want to make a movie a netflix or a hulu is going to immediately come up and say here's two million dollars to get started which would be absurd in the 90s that that's a mentality that just didn't happen yeah. so the, the entire mechanics have changed yeah and, and and unfortunately they've changed in a way that if you look at the filmmakers of like uh the late 70s the mid 70s who had that freedom with what they considered um, lightweight equipment like the eclair cameras and things like that the handheld cameras the airflex cameras um, they were able to do this great work the problem now is that um, with netflix netflix has uh, along with a lot of the other streaming services they've closed the doors around them they're not open to independent film at all they really aren't um, unless you've had a theatrical release and you've been really successful they're not interested in your film. They don't even want to look at it. They, they've got so much goddamn money from tech and from this technology that we're talking on now that they just want to make sure that you pay your 16 bucks a month or whatever they can get. And that's what the fight is over now. So you're back into this world of paying for stars and paying for people backed by agencies and agents and packaging and things that, you know, independents are not allowed to be part of unless you've had some kind of fluke success. Um, so, you know, sadly, although the barrier to entry is really high, still, how do you reach your audience? YouTube's not going to make your money back on your movie, you know? No. And you're in a situation where I, I find it frustrating. Like, I like my comic book movies. Not <laughs> saying I don't. But people are like, I'm tired of reboots. I'm tired of comic book movies. They keep complaining about what they're getting too much of. And like, but we have these legions of people who are making great movies we're just having trouble getting seen. It's not like what you're looking for isn't there. Yeah, no, I think it's true. And, and I have to say, maybe this is just me, but a lot of these limited series, binge watch series, 
um, which I've watched a few of, they feel really padded. You know, I, I, people say, oh, you got to watch this new, you got to watch this that. And I'm like, this is a movie that should have been an 80 minute movie and it's seven, seven 60 minute episodes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and coming off of really great stuff like Breaking Bad or The Sopranos or whatever, how far back you want to go. I just see a lot of what you're seeing on these streaming services is really padded. Um, and really you're getting kind of the worst of what television can be sometimes. Um, yes, there's some great breakout stuff, um, but it's rare and it's A-list. You know, it's Michael Douglas um, and Chuck Lorre who did Two and a Half Men, that's A-list. Um, there's no room for independence or for finding independence, unfortunately. And, and it's a shame that, like you said, I agree that it's padded. I agree that there is a lot of cases where, you know, a, a series that is six episodes could have been three, one that's 10 could have been eight. And it, it seems like we've come around to the point where in the nineties, I would get hooked on a show, um, you know, usually a sci-fi show and a 23 episode season really had 15 good episodes in it. Right. And the rest were something they had to make to fill the season. Right. And it seems like we should have gotten away from that when we went to streaming, but we didn't. Well, I, I think it's unfortunately the nature of the business of, of making movies or making, you know, filmed entertainment is that, uh, you know, they, they want to keep you watching their streaming services as much as they can. And their goal is to get you. And then hopefully you will forget that that little charge on your credit card every month, whether you're on Disney plus or, or um, Netflix, you know, because you wanted to watch The Mandalorian, say, um, which is the case with myself and my son. We wanted to watch The Mandalorian. I don't think I've watched anything else on Disney Plus because we just want to watch that show. And by the way, I'm I am still paying for it, so I'm the dumb victim too, you know. Yeah, you really have to start auditing what you're watching and what you're paying for, and make sure the two have some sort of relationship with each other. Yeah, because at some point, you, like I said, you're getting so many charges per month. And I'm, I'm a big advocate of cord cutting. I, I don't like cable. I don't like satellite. I like choosing what I want. And I, I don't mind spending the money on it. That's, right. that's the thing. It's like people think you're trying to get away from paying for stuff. No, I just, I don't want to pay for stuff I'm not using. And, and the amount of um, advertising that they shove into any movie on, on the pay stations right now. Mm -hmm. you, I was last night. Uh, no, no, it was the night before last. I was, my son hadn't seen Castaway with Tom Hanks which is, I'm, I'm a big fan of that movie. It's a great movie. Um, and he'd never seen it. He got into it, but the goddamn commercials halfway through just about, well, they did, they threw us off. We were just like, there were more commercials than programming. And, you know, that threw us off. And, and um, it's also not a, the, having, personally, the reason I loved it is because I saw Castaway in the, in the theater, you know, which is the place to see it. Um, mm -hmm just ruined the experience for us. So yeah, I'm a big fan of cord cutting too. The problem you have, and, and I don't want to go on too long about this, but really quickly, if you look at Netflix, for example, if you dial down deep into their menu, you'll find a lot of foreign movies and they're really aggressively breaking into foreign countries, you know, using indigenous movies and movies from France, movies from Germany, movies from um, Africa, you name it, you know, third world countries, and programming to those those people and then sending things out to them and th and just about anything that's indigenous and popular they'll promote and they're there what they're not doing and what they don't give a shit about is any kind of independent film culture here in the united states so any filmmakers here in the united states are really limited but mostly to festivals to finding your audience unless your movie really breaks out and that's sad and i've been to a lot of film festivals seen a lot of great movies and never seen the light of day. And so circle back around to Mystery Science Theater. As much as, you know, Time Chasers um, would, you know, be my first movie and I was really young, that movie probably would have been a forgotten movie if it wasn't for Mystery Science Theater and then Rift Tracks um, making fun of it. So I get it. So I was, and I've been asked that question of how do you feel about Mystery Science Theater and Rift Tracks making fun of your mm -hmm. movies? as I've gotten older, I'm just like, I was always, as much as some of the jokes hurt, I was always really just happy to be invited to the dance, you know? Uh, and that's still true. I'm going to make a confession. I don't think I've ever said it on this show. I don't think I've ever said it on the internet period. Uh -oh, I'm, here we go. I'm not the biggest fan of the Rocky horror picture show. Mm -hmm. 
I, I don't dislike it per se, but every time I've tried to enjoy it with other people, it's like it doesn't click with me. But the idea of having an event movie that you watch with friends and have a mutual fun experience that's full of joy and mirth and whimsy, I get that with Mystery Science Theater. Right. right. When I'm sitting down and I'm watching Manos or I'm watching Mitchell and we all know the jokes and we're, that's, I have the same experience they have with Rocky Horror that I'm just not clicking with that. I, I have that there. And so I really hope that you do kind of get behind the treatment they're giving it because it's, people are having so much fun with it. And I will sit watch and watch without the puppets too. I, sure. I can enjoy sure. it on that level. Yeah, and, and you know, it's really funny. In 2016, um, we, uh, Rift Tracks re riff Time Chasers, as everybody knows. And part of the deal, part of the negotiation with them was uh, I had never paid the cast because we, we it never, it didn't really make money on paper. And so I said, hey, we're all going down to Nashville. And I invited everybody. George Woodard didn't want to go, but he came. Um, and we all ended up in a theater with over 700 people doing, at the live, we were at the live broadcast, which went out to another 700 theaters. And um, we had the most fun and we made the damn thing. We were in the thing, they were making fun of us and we were hoarse with laughter. I mean, we were it was just such a great communal experience. And that was, and it was, just, and it was also really weird because it was the second time we got riffed. So we were really prepared. We just had so much fun. The cast and I, and I'll never forget this, after we left and we signed autographs and we did everything, we signed, I think we signed 400 autographs, they told us something like that. Um, we ended up at a bar at the hotel because we were all buzzing, we were excited. We, like, we, like we'd been to a really great movie, it was our movie. And, uh, and we remastered for HD, which was great. Um, but we were all just buzzing because we had had such a great time and we were the people that made the damn thing. I don't know, decade and a half before. So, you know, that communal movie experience is, I mean, that's why I started becoming a filmmaker. So how do you get that? How do you get to there to that point? It's fine. We had a great time. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. That's why we do this. And I, I'm sure if, you know, go back 30 years and you're planning on how to make time chasers and, you know, if you could dream a dream, you'd want it to be the next Star Wars. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sure. You knew I that probably. It, I, I thought it was at the time. But. Sure. I, I mean, maybe you didn't, maybe you thought it was in the cards, maybe you didn't, right. but you still managed to make something that, that really resonated. And it's a decent movie. I would actually say it's a good movie within the frame it's at. Thank you. Yeah. I, now, confession again, I'm a big fan for time travel movies in general. I, I yeah. really, I get into them, I dig them, yep. and I overlook a lot of stuff because I just want to get into that story. So right. maybe I'm not the best judge. No, 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 and I appreciate that, and 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 I think you're absolutely right for for what we were doing at the time and for what it was. And I'm also a fan of time travel movies. I still have another time travel screenplay um, that we've been working on, and uh, and yeah, that's the way we, you know. But but it, to what you said, if I could tell myself back when I was 19 that I'd be doing a podcast with you, still talking about this movie, and I'm still moving. DVDs and T-shirts, and it's still it's, it's about to come up with another streaming run. I'd be like, that's insane. I, even you know, in my wildest dreams, that's insane. But that happened because it got the 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 attention of Mystery Science Theater. I can't deny that. Yeah, yeah, the, that crew is in their own way a boon for film preservation. I agree, hundred percent. Yeah, I really. And do. I would say not just the, the preservation of the films themselves. It's the preservation of the film culture, which has changed dramatically over time. It's very true. And you know, it's interesting. Um, I'm also a fan of M MST3K and the Rift Tracks people. And, you know, a film like Manos, which was shot with a wind up camera, no sound, all post sync, which I'd never in a million years think of doing something as insane in that, as that. I would never know about that movie if it weren't for Mystery Science Theater. And knowing about that movie, because I know, and there have been documentaries about the behind the scenes and everything, I just find, you know, in, in terms of someone who's interested in film culture and films, I just find it really fascinating that if it weren't for Mr. Science Theater, I would have never heard of Monos, mm -hmm. you know? It's like, I, I love to capture those moments. Like I said, you were the, the pre-golden age of independent film when VHS was the king. And that 
people like me who learned movies on VHS and to an extent Laserdisc, we had a different experience to when I was talking with Arch Hall Jr. And he was saying at that point in time, the dominant experience was drive-in movies. Right. There was a whole culture that came from people who had to watch movies by driving up and watching low budget slasher movies, which is different than today. Kids are watching movies under their covers on their cell phones. Right. I don't know what that's like. I, yeah. I don't know what it's like to grow up. I would like to. I, I'm looking forward to having that conversation when these kids grow up. Yeah, maybe it's their culture. I don't know. You know, um, I do know that, you know, what we did was interesting because there was a time where VHS was hot and that was a way of consuming movies with, you know, without the barriers to entry of the major studios. And again, like I throw us all back to the, you know, the, the mid seventies when you, you could get an easy rider out there or something like that in drive-ins. I think there was a window where VHS did that for us. I also think there was a window where DVD even bigger did that for us. Uh, that window's closed. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore. It's sad because, um, because that business worked, you know, and it was, it was a great way you could walk into a video store and find a strange film and, you know. Yeah, because DVDs were so cheap to make, and the, at that point, I said the equipment was cheap enough that you, you put your mind to getting it, you, you would get it. Right. That, like I right. said, the, the mid-2000s were that boon era. Mm -hmm. And I, at the time, was doing movie reviews for a certain website. I mean, I would just be shipped boxes of DVDs, like giant boxes. And right. there was not, that wouldn't have been economical at any other point. Right. I found right. so many great films that people were just willing to send me for the cost of postage. Sure, sure. And, 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 you know, I mean, we, we rode that for a long, long time and uh, until it crashed around 2007, 2008 for us. Um, and it crashed hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will tell you this, we did, and, and, and for, and not for reasons that having anything to do with the marketplace, but we did Anna Nicole Smith's last movie, a movie called Legal Aliens, which, um, was shot on the cheap and it was a sci-fi spoof and it was uh, my attempt to do comedy and um, and we were, everybody was high on it. And I literally, um, my distributor, um, MTI Home Video at the time, got huge orders from Walmart and all these places we did. We sold uh, 60,000 units to the US military so they could send DVDs overseas for the guys. I mean, that, that, that movie was right ready to take off and it did great, except at that time, Walmart, there was no, I mean, there was Blockbuster, so there was a Blockbuster order, but there was no real big Netflix thing at the time. Walmart was the thing. And so we had a gigantic Walmart order for DVDs. And um, the problem is, is by the time we'd finished the movie and then shipped the DVDs and everything else and orders done, whatever. Her son had overdosed and she had overdosed and they'd overdosed on drugs. Mm -hmm. And it, it was beginning, I mean, celebrity overdoses have gotten worse and worse and worse since. But at the time, the shock of that was enough that Walmart wouldn't stock our movie. And the deal is, Walmart buys your movie, they say, we want half a million copies, which is what they wanted. Uh, and it's what we shipped all over, all over the United States. Uh, but then when the drug allegations came in and I was on Larry King and everything, I was on all kinds of Fox news, you name it, talking about Anna Nicole Smith, which is something I don't want to talk about ever again. But mm -hmm. my point is with Walmart, you ship those DVDs. If they don't sell them, you have to ship them back and own them. They're yours. And so that's what they did. They never put them on the shelves. They left them in the, the warehouses and they shipped the movie back for us. And that was, uh, I think we got back 300,000 copies of our movie, Illegal Aliens, which to this day, I still have two pallets sitting in a warehouse. So if you need some drink coasters or whatever, or things to scare birds away, I've got a ton of those. And the market from then also changed, started to die and it became more an internet-based business. And so that's for me, 2007, that was two, maybe between 2007 and 2009, 2010, things really changed. Um, the internet came in and, and it was never the same business. Now, that was the, kind of the, the point where it, people realized that streaming media was going to be viable. Mm -hmm. It took another four or five years to actually get to that point, but you could see where the wind was blowing. Yeah, we had done some other films and they did, in comparison, nothing you know, to what we had done five, 10 years ago. Okay. 
So I don't want to take up too much more of your time because I know that, you know, we've both got a lot going on, but I am having a lot of fun here. Well, good. Well, go, go ask. Okay. So if you can pull together another idea for a higher concept movie with the resources you have now, where would you like to take it? Uh, you mean in terms of, of what I want to do for another movie or in terms of another? Uh, not so much. I mean, yes, what you'd like to do for another movie, but is there a, a personal goal that you see in the future that you haven't been able to touch just yet? Um, no, because I made uh, Accelerator and, um, and my goal for Accelerator was to be, that's my phone, that'll stop in a second. Sure. Um, the goal for Accelerator was to be, spend a lot of time producing um, my own stuff and being, and sometimes being the cinematographer. And my goal for um, Accelerator was to spend time with the actors and the screenplay and work on that and forget about what the director of photography is doing and what the producing is and everything else. And, um, and I tried as hard as I could on Accelerator to do that, but it didn't happen completely. But I had a really great experience on that movie. Really enjoyed working with all the actors and working with everybody and, and really grateful to work with them. But I was still the guy, because it was such a low budget movie, I, I, I had one, I, I said, I'll drive one of the campers. We had three campers and, that, and, and that's a big deal in one of these movies. And I had a small camper. I said, this will be my director's lair. I can rehearse in here. I can do whatever. Well, it ended up becoming the wardrobe trailer. I'm like, oh, that's okay. I can just get out of here. Everybody gets dressed. That's fine. It's covered in, you know, so it's covered in wardrobe. So I'm also, because these movies are small, I'm the last guy off location no matter what. So everybody else goes home. I lock up the location. I make sure it's safe. Make sure we're out of there. And so it was pouring rain. Um, and, I, and I'm in my, but I, I'm like, great, we had a good day, I'm done for the weekend and work on the script and get back to making a movie. And I get in this big RV, which all this stuff is old and decrepit because you borrow it. You know, it's not like these are, you know, there's no glamorous part of this at all. Mm. So I get in this RV and I pull out of the parking lot and go over a curb and the, the tailpipe of the goddamn thing falls off and is dragging down the street. So now I'm underneath it, uh, realizing the tailpipe's dragging down the street, I'm soaking wet. And I'm like, oh, I'll just wire the damn thing up. You know, I got, I got a million coat hangers. I'm the wardrobe trailer. I'm like, oh, I'm the wardrobe trailer. And it's all plastic hangers. There's not one wire hanger. It's the opposite of Joan Crawford and I'm on I was going to say, there's a mommy dearest joke yeah. ready to go here. <laughs> and so the only thing I had left were my earbuds from my iPhone. And I ended up wiring up the tailpipe uh, with the earbuds from my, wi wi my iPhone with the water running down my back on the street because it's boring fucking rain. The point being is that uh, my goal is if I get to make other movies is to be the artist and just focus on making the movie. Have some really great screenplays, some really great ideas and uh, I'm still pursuing them. And now that the pandemic is settling down, everybody's kind of talking again. And uh, I think it's more realistic. Uh, the Screen Actors Guild, I don't know if you know, had really tight restrictions on shooting in the pandemic. So it was really expensive. It was, it really shut down independence because you just couldn't do the, the SAG guidelines, which involved a crap load of testing. So I think as we go further and I start to move with ideas, my goal, and I was a long way around for a simple answer. My goal is um, to make the movie where I'm just the creative, I'm just the director and I don't have to be the producer or checking the prop master or anything else. I can just be the, you know, that guy and that includes and I have a time travel story that I like that I think is unique and I know most time travel stories are about going back around and resetting the clock. This one's a little different, which I thought was great. Um, I have a couple great survival stories and I've, I've got some great stuff. You know, the, it's been a, the, the 2020 was a fruitful period for me, which is great. Whether I get this stuff to screen, I, you know, my fingers are crossed. I'm very interested. Like I said, I love time travel stories. So if you can even play with the format just a little bit, I'm all about that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not uh, telling you though. I can't tell. No, no, no. no. I, I, the, the pitch for this is really great. It's a time travel story that is really different. Um, I mean, they're all the same. You know, if you really love time travel stories, they're all kind of the same anyways. But uh, this one's a little different. Um, it's a from a book we've optioned and... Uh, 
And like all time travel stories, we haven't solved all the problems in it yet. I can tell you right now. So we're working on that. A buddy was trying to write one mm -hmm. and he came to me for advice about the science of it. Not that I'm anything close to qualified to answer it, but he's like, well, are people going to believe it if I say it's this or that? And I said, it doesn't matter. When it comes to time travel stories, the mechanics, unless you're making it specifically about the science, which is a whole different kettle of fish, it doesn't matter if it's a car or a phone booth or going around the sun backwards. How you get back in time or forward in time is usually the least important part of the story. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's funny because uh, when I saw Looper, um, and Bruce Willis has a line in Looper instead of doing a lot of stuff, he just sits down and he's at a booth in the diner and they're talking about what is this time travel thing. And he says, look, you want to talk about time travel? We're not going to, not going to talk about time travel. Otherwise we'll be here all day with graphs and charts and, and straws and crap. And, you know, and I thought, my God, what a brilliant way. It was Ryan Johnson. What a brilliant way to dispense with all the crap and just get to the story. And, um, and Ryan, who went on to make The Last Jedi and Knives Out, and I think I think really talented guy. I always thought that was like the most brilliant way of dealing with a time travel problem. You don't need Doc Brown running around, you know. Just eh, you don't really want to know. Let's just move on. I, I wrote one that I put up on Amazon a while back. I'll link it in the notes if it'll help anybody. But the the way I got around it was I just said, okay, well, if I don't want to talk about this, how can I make the audience not want to care? So I said, well, what if I make it something really boring? And I, my time travel technology was essentially a really, an innovation on shipping. It was a logistics problem. Oh, right. Somebody figured out, okay, well, we, we'll just, in, instead of, you know, UPSing it, we'll just time travel it out there. It's like, that will make the audience not even want to ask the question. Right, right. It's true. It's, you know, it's funny that you were, you just mentioned that and you mentioned shipping. Um, I just rewatched, as I mentioned earlier on the podcast, Castaway with Tom Hanks. And I didn't realize the whole subtext of that movie being about time. You know, I, I realized, I thought it was about loss and all this other shit, but it was really about time and what we do with the time we have. And, um, I, I, you know, I guess it's why you watch movies more than once. So. Yeah. So, David, since you've got the stuff on the burner, where can people find your misadventures and keep track on these upcoming movies? So the best way to keep track on what I'm doing is to go to edgewoodstudios.com. Um, it's a website. Um, we have a Facebook page, but we don't, you know, which is Edgewood Studios. You can, you can follow our Facebook page as well, which is simple to find as Edgewood Studios. Um, but our website, I know it's a little old school. I know people like that. Instagram and everything else uh, is the best place to keep track of us, edgewoodstudios.com. And if not, join, join our Facebook page, follow us. And uh, when new stuff comes up, whether we're casting or whether we're shooting or whatever, we post it online and it's there. So that's awesome. Best. I am going to link that in the show notes. And as soon as I catch that movie, I am going to be on the horn trying to get a hold of you again. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here, David. I would definitely like to have you back sometime soon. You got it. Anytime, my friend. Let me know.